Hey guys and welcome to SA Cricket Magazine Weekly Show. I'm your host Khalid Mohidin and today we're back at Newlands and I'm here with SA Cricket Magazine editor Simon Lewis. And we're going to discuss obviously the 2-1 series victory Proteas against Australia. What a series, ups and downs, there were some great performances, some weak performances by both sides. But actually quite an equal contest I would say with regards to the issues that both sides have. Um, let's start with the the first ODI, second ODI, third ODI, obviously we're going to talk about each individually. But let's talk about the series win first and what that means for South Africa. So Simon, this is the first ever series win in a decade for the Proteas in Australia, against Australia. And uh, also it was an amazing partnership by David Miller and Fafti Pussy that actually won us this game. Yeah. But there obviously are still some worries that Proteas batting collapses in all three of the ODIs. So, what do you want to talk about the series and what do you think that means to us? I think it's, it was a great series, uh, very important to have won. I would have liked us to win 3 0. We could have won, won 3 0. We probably should have won 3 0. The second one, we had a bit of a dip, but you know, this happens and that's, you know, that's cricket, that's sport. Part of the beauty of sport that, that nothing's too, um, you know, too, too expected or consistent. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, I've been looking back at statistics and I've realized also we've, we've maybe been a bit tough on some of the guys recently. Yeah. Because actually it's a very young and inexperienced side, the, the batting order. Um, we're without um, Hashim Amla, AB is left for now, I think he's going to be back. Um, and also JP Dumini is not there. Um, Heinrich Klaassen's played 12 ODIs, okay. Reza Hendricks played 9, Aidan Markram 16, Dwayne Pretorius 14. That's four of the top seven batsmen who between them have got 30 odd ODIs. So you've got to cut them some slack. They're young and inexperienced. They're still good enough to beat Australia. Not a great Australian side, but yeah. they're still competitive. But I think we did well. The guys have got a lot to learn. But when, the, when Hashim and um, JP come back, we're going to be so much stronger. Yeah, and that's the issue at the moment because we obviously know that for the, the number three position, there are two players competing for it, and it's quite clear who the Proteas want in that position, or the, who the selectors want in that position. It's either Riza Hendrix or Aidan Markham that they want in that number three slot. Then we have another issue at the bottom of the order, in the number six position, where we have, if JP comes back and that's the number five, then we have JP, then we have, sorry, then we have David Miller, we have Andre Klassen, and maybe Farhan Beradin is going to compete for that position. Yeah. And then we have another spot where there's a few people competing in, and that's the number seven position with an all-rounder. So we have Andile Pechlequayo, we have Chris Morris, and of course we have Dwayne Pretorius, who had a great season. So let's start for the number three position. Aidan Markham or Riza Hendricks? I like them both. Um, I was talking to Alistair, who's not here today. Uh, he, he was back in the office working. And what we actually were saying was that um, Amla should be number three. And either Riza or Aidan should be opening. And we were actually discussing, we thought that Aiden should actually be the opener. Because what, what happens, what, what you saw in the series now, Aiden comes out and he, he just he starts blazing. Plays fantastic shots, great stroke player, but he, he keeps on getting out for low scores. And that might be bad luck and that, that's what happens sometimes, but he's not following through. So maybe what we need to say is, or what the selector should say is, let Markram open with um, Quinton de Kock. Yeah. Depending on the circumstances, sometimes Reza may be open. So have those two guys uh, as, as swapping uh, uh, openers. Let Quinton and, and Aiden just go play their natural game. Just go hell for leather, do whatever they want, um, and see what happens. Yeah. If we lose a wicket or two early, then what the guys need to do is like what Faf and, and David Miller did was consolidate. Important reason for Quinton to do this is um, he's, he's one of the most consistent batsmen in terms of scoring centuries. So I've been thinking recently that he's, he plays far too loose too early, but actually it works for him. He's failed a few times recently, but in general he, it really works. Virat Kohli has got 18% of his innings are centuries in ODIs. Hashim Amla 15%, fantastic. Um, David Warner 13.46, and just below him is Quinton de Kock 13.27. So, uh, so Quinton is the sixth highest proportion of how many centuries he scores per innings. That's quite phenomenal. So obviously it's working for him. So let him go out and, and keep on playing his natural game. Um, and if it doesn't come off, the, the lower order guys need to consolidate. I think a, a problem with Heinrich Klaas and, and Dwayne Pretorius was in the second ODI, they had a fantastic chance to both dig in and, and score 50 or 60. Yeah. And they both went out playing strong attacking shots. Not against attacking, but you saw what happened with, with um, uh, Miller and Duplessis. 
just taking it easy, taking the time sometimes, sets you up for a big push later on in the innings. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about if you're going to drop Ashim Amla and that to number three, then that means that you're going to break up one of the best partnerships that the World Cricket has, so South Africa yeah. has ever seen, you know the eyes. So, and also, you, you're taking Amla out of his national gameplay where he's very, very good in the power play. He's finding gaps with his wrist movement. So, Amla's a little, yes, Amla's been a little bit of form, but do you move him out of that position? I'm not really sure, and I can understand that argument. But let's move on from that, and let's talk about the next issue that we have, and that's with regards to our number six position in this number six spot. We saw David Miller in that innings. We scored 139 in, in, in record time. I mean, it's the fastest century ever scored against Australia in Australia for a South African player. Yeah. So, I mean, he played a phenomenal innings, and this is the David Miller that I was talking about that I would love to have seen. A guy that just changes his game plan, sees South Africa through until the end. And I love that for Miller. But he needed time to take his time, change his game plan, and that's the situation him and Fafu to see. And that's how I feel that they went forward. So with regards to that, do you think that David Miller should maybe be pushed up the order? Could we have a top order with Amala, Quinton the Cock, and then have Fafi number three, then have Miller maybe at number four, Dumini in number five, and Klaas in number three? I, I, to me, I wouldn't drop um, Markram or Hendricks or Klaassen. Klaassen is a great player, but they both got more to offer than him. Um, he, he hasn't got enough experience yet, he hasn't proven himself. He's proven, he's proven he can play well and he can play well. He's a great cricketer and he should be in the World Cup squad as backup for, for Quinton. I, I wouldn't put him ahead of Markram or, or Hendricks. Klaassen really needs to, to, to dig down and sort of, when he has an opportunity to score runs, to, to, to bat out 20 30 overs if necessary and get himself a 60 or 70 80 not worry about the run rate but make sure he builds at that score um, and you know he's also he's been out caught pulling a few times as well um, to me that's that's not the player that you replace Hendricks or Markham but if he was doing a Lance Clusen and pulling and hitting all over the place and getting big runs then yeah but he's not quite doing it for me to warrant dropping either of those guys for have him in the squad and he'll hopefully play and make make an impact in the World Cup so I'm not by all means saying that I think that should happen, but I just wanted to bring up the topic. I just wanted to bring up the topic because it is an interesting point to yeah. look at it. Because I mean, if David Miller has a little bit more time, he showed what he can do. Um, he showed that he can structure his innings and put on a big score. He doesn't need to be seen only as a big hitting player that everybody thinks. Miller obviously is keen to bat half the order because he wants to prove what he can do and yeah. not always to be in at the end having to having to smash runs because what happens is that your record starts to look bad and then people start to doubt you. That yeah. happened to JP Dumini as well. A few months ago people were calling for his head. Now he's one of the first names on the team sheet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, possibly he could, he could move down. To me the big thing I think, and this includes, we said this last week, um, Faf and Miller and JP, all of those players, even Klaas and if he's playing whoever, they need to be more fluid I think. Need to see who, who's bowling, what, what, what the team is, what the score is, and shuffle the guys around. Let them, you know, if it's, if, if it's looking good for Miller, push him in at number three if necessary, if there's been a centre of everything stand. Uh, I wouldn't worry about having a set order. You have to have an order idea, but I wouldn't worry about having a set order. Okay, so next step before we go into another more pressing topic later, the next step for me is the number seven position. And we need to talk about this because, I mean, obviously South Africa is looking for a batting all rounder in a position that can bow and bat. They went with Dwayne Petro, this is possibly our best batting all-rounder that we have. He's the best batsman out of our bowlers, our bowling all-rounders that we have. He showed it for the Lions. We have Chris Morris in that option, but he's more of a big hitting type of guy. He comes, you see, my issue is we need a batsman that can pick up an innings when we have a batting collapse. And someone that can switch his mindset and play an attacking brand of cricket as well if we're in trouble. Now Chris Morris comes in and he's a good blaster. We see in the 2020s, he comes in for the IPL and he just he can score that twin pick 20s or five, six, seven balls or whatever you want to call it Liverpool. He can he score those quick 20s. And a little bit quiet, I see him as a similar type of player. Going victorious is a type of guy that can maybe block it out and grind it out if we have a big hitter at the other end that is in and set and we gather add a quick um, flurry of wickets, he can just bring calmness. There's another name that people are speaking about that they want to bring in, especially after he's handled for the Cobras, and that's Werner Villanova. Do people, do you think, or do, in the general public, do, I want to know if, what you guys think, do you think that Vernon in his career now has improved his batting enough to be considered for a number 7 spot in the World Cup? 
That's one thing. From a batting perspective. From a bowling perspective, the way he maneuvers the ball and he keeps it on a specific spot and can keep a batsman in his crease. And the swing that he can create in England because the, obviously the World Cup's in England. Yeah. Doesn't he become like a death death? <laughs> uh, it's tricky. I mean, to, to me, Andile is the man, without a doubt. Um, he's, uh, taking Vernon out, out of the equation, Andile has got... He's only played 34 ODIs, but his average is 26. Klaassen's average is 25. Very early to, to be, to be um, comparing averages, so it's not fair really, but just out of interest, Klaassen's 25, Reza Hendricks is 27, Aidan Markham's 25. So Andile's average is 26 in ODIs. Benefited from almost half those innings to be not out. That's quite a good sign in a way. Also, it's something that again um, skews the figures. Um, but uh, I, I just like the way he bowls and, and the slight difference he adds to the attack. Yeah. Um, and to me, he's, he needs to up his batting game a bit to be to take advantage of some bigger innings possibly. Um, I would still go with him. I, I think Vernon's a, a hell of a good batsman actually. Um, but to me, to me, I'd go with Andile. Tell us why you like why Vernon. Yeah. Okay, so the, the main thing I like about Vernon is, is we see it in the test matches. He's, he's arguably one of the best bowlers in the world in the test format. And what he does brilliantly is keeping it on a spot. And, and, and he's very economical with regards to that. He can bowl the ball consistently on one, on one space at a time. I'm not saying he should be our opening bowler. Because obviously we've got Dainstein and Lingi Ngidi has been phenomenal. We've got a first change bowler of Kakis Rabada. Now imagine if Kakis Rabada and Vernie Philander in the middle of it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, quite scary. that's quite scary. And and, and he can bat a bit too. I think I would take Vernie Philander over Dwayne Victorious. I'll take Vernie yeah. Philander over Chris Morris. And Dila Pech requires one for the future, but he needs to really improve his batting if he really wants to, to cement that spot. Now comes a more pressing topic. I want to talk about the Proteus' attacking brand of cricket that they want to play. This positive brand of cricket that's been flying around for the last few months. Now, you have some stats over there that you that you, yeah. that you mentioned, mentioned to me earlier on, where you said that with regards to the Proteus' is a, a way of playing, we've seen three different types of styles of, of approaches to cricket from our batsmen. We can confidently say that our Proteus bowlers are phenomenal, that we've got a world-class bowling attack, and I back them every single time to get take to take all ten weeks. So um, my issue is that we saw a different type of batting style that won us the game against Australia in the final game, where Faf and David Miller really changed their game plan. Faf played his natural game. That's what I love about Faf is that he's perfect for the number three, number four position because he comes in and he just calms everything down. Yeah. And that's that's phenomenal about Faf, and I think Faf is one of the best captains in the world for that. And if if anything's gonna be, win us the World Cup, it's gonna be our bowling and Faf's captaincy. I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, it, it, whenever we need him, he steps up. I mean, that was a massive hundred that he scored to give us to, to to see us come down after three four wickets down, and he comes in after three wickets down, and he comes in and he plays innings like that. But they didn't play that positive brand of cricket mm -hmm. in that game. So what's your thoughts on the positive brand of cricket? Is it actually hindering our performances in the bat, with the bat? I think, I think there's just maybe a misinterpretation of the positive cricket. They, they, they seem to want to be positive right from the start. And as you said earlier, if you're going to have Quinton and say, or Quinton and Hashem, or Quinton and, um, and Aiden, or Quinton and Reza, if their natural game is to go flat out, then let them go flat out from the start, that's fine. But once you start losing some wickets, the rest of the team really then need to knuckle down. We saw it with Pretorius, and Klaassen, in the second ODI, they were playing very aggressive, expansive shots when they had 25, 30 overs left. You've got to value your wicket. I don't see us valuing our wicket enough. You, you can play positive cricket, but it's no point being positive if, you, if you're playing too adventurous too early. That's just risking your wicket. You want to rather, you know, almost not grind the bowlers down because there isn't time for that, but you want to get yourself feeling confident um, and build that platform. It's almost like a, what, what Fuff and David did was that they, they built a fantastic platform at, at Hobart in, in the final ODI. And from that bigger platform gets, when you get to the, the final push, yeah. you go faster down. 130 rounds of 10 overs speaks itself. It's crazy. So maybe that positive brand of it's the way we construct our innings before we get to that positive stage. I feel that we have the batsmen to be able to play a balanced style of cricket where we can yeah. turn it on, turn it off when we need to. Once the batsmen are set, once the batsmen are in, they can take a positive mind. It's about it's, it's not just about sticking to a game plan and that's where I want to come in with regards to that. To win the World Cup, 
you don't necessarily have to just stick to one game plan and play that one game plan right through the tournament. I feel that you have to adapt according to who you, what you're facing. And that's what I think the Totes have been lacking in. The second ODI, we went 48 runs, 129 runs, 47 runs. Okay? The 129 runs, we lost four wickets. In the third ODI, it was 27 runs, 163 runs, losing one wicket, and then 130 runs. So it showed even though you have a slow start, it gives you a chance to really build up to really go fast at the end with the confidence of having wickets in hand and also not having given the bowlers confidence. You start losing wickets, gives the bowlers confidence, gives the batsmen more worry that if I go out now, oh, number six or seven's coming in, you know, we really need to, to work on that. I think. But, but to me, that's a big thing for them to realize that, that they can take it a bit slower early if they have to. Um, and especially if they lose a couple of wickets, Quinton and Aiden go mad, you know, go out and, and hammer as much as you want. Lose a wicket or two, the rest of the guys, take it slow, pull that inning. That's it guys, I want to know what you guys think of all of the topics that we spoke about. I know there's a lot for you guys to take in, but I would like you to leave your comments in the comment section below. And let us know what your feelings are about the Amazing Series win, about the World Cup coming up, about the Pakistan Series, the Sri Lanka Series. We will bring you videos before that, but I would like to know your comments in the comment section below. Like all our platforms.